Hey guys, today I'm going to talk to you about omega-3 fatty acids, specifically fish and krill oil. What are they and what makes them so special? We're going to describe the chemical structure of omega-3 fatty acids and go into some details of ALA and EPA and DHA, which you probably recognize as the most common omega-3s that you find in the little supplement section of the uh, grocery store. And we're going to talk about their proposed role in heart health and stroke prevention. We'll finish this up by talking about specialized pro-resolving mediators, or SPM, which are probably the chemicals that are derived from these omega-3s that afford us some protection from chronic disease. So it's gonna be a lot to take in. We're gonna take it step by step, and I promise you, you're gonna be an expert to impress your friends and family at the next social gathering. Before we get started, we need to go over a few definitions, and I wanna talk about a free fatty acid first and foremost. And this is an example of a free fatty acid. It has a carboxyl head at one end with a hydrocarbon chain on the other end. And we call it a hydrocarbon chain because if you look at this, it's made up of carbons and hydrogen. So a hydrocarbon chain. The side that has the carboxyl head is called the alpha side of the free fatty acid. The other side, the far end, the last carbon and hydrogen, is called the omega end of that fatty acid. And the one I'm showing you right now is a saturated fatty acid. And the reason it's saturated is because every potential binding site on the carbon chain is occupied by a hydrogen. So it is saturated with hydrogen atoms, all right? I wanna to talk to you about unsaturated fatty acids, but we first have to go into a little bit of chemistry, and I promise you it's just gonna be some basic stuff. We're gonna go through some of the details of the atoms that make up the fatty acid, and this is carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. And if you look at these, all of these atoms try to get to a noble state. And what a noble state is, is to look like the far right side of the periodic table where they have a complete set of valence electrons. And for most of the atoms on the periodic table, that magic number is eight, all right? So a complete set of valence electrons is an octet or eight. Carbon has four. So to get to eight, it needs four more. Oxygen has six. And to get its complete set, it needs two more. And of course, hydrogen has one, and to look like its noble cousin helium, it just needs one more, and that makes it happy. So if you look at carbon, it is in the very middle of that octet. It has four, and so it has some magical properties, and that's why we are all carbon-based organisms. Everything that makes up our bodies and every other living organism on Earth is carbon-based because of that magical element. Carbon is capable of making single bonds, double bonds, and even triple bonds. And because it can do all that, it's uh, very special for life itself. So if you look, go back and look at our saturated fatty acid, as I said before, each of the carbons is completely saturated with hydrogen. If I take one of those single bonds between the carbon chain, change it to a double bond, now we have each of the carbons sharing two of their valence electrons with the other carbon, so four in total. So now you can get rid of two of these hydrogens. And you can see that when you get rid of two of the hydrogens, they're always from the same side. The ones that are going to be remaining are on the same but opposite side so that's called a cis configuration. If they're on the same side, cis means same. Trans would be on the opposite side. If you have one of these unsaturated molecules, one double bond, this is called monounsaturated. If you have multiple double bonds, that's called polyunsaturated. Now what's interesting is because you have these two hydrogens on the same side of the molecule, they're positively charged, they repel each other. So they cause the molecule to bend slightly. Right? And as it bends, it changes the conformational configuration of the free fatty acid. It gives you special quality. So you know that saturated fats usually are solid at room temperature. It's because they're straight and they can pack them tightly. Whereas unsaturated fats have these bends in them and they're tougher to pack together. So they're usually liquid at room temperature. Now I wanna look specifically at the omega-3 fatty acids. What's specific about these is that these are unsaturated fats, but the first double bond always occurs from the third carbon from the omega side of the molecule. And that's where they get their name from, omega-3 fatty acids. 
they can have multiple double bonds in there. So you can have it at the omega-3, you can have it at the omega-6, the 9, the 12, the 15, but as long as that first double bond is on the omega-3, it qualifies as an omega-3 fatty acid. Looking at the free fatty acid, this is the energy form of that molecule. When we're storing fat in our body, it's not as a free fatty acid, it's usually as a triglyceride. And a triglyceride consists of three of these fatty acid molecules, and it's attached to an alcohol called glycerol, which you see here. Glycerol is a three carbon backbone, and it's got these hydroxyl groups hanging off of it. And so when you combine the glycerol with these three fatty acids, that's called an esterification reaction. Anytime you put an acid with an alcohol, that's called esterification. And each time one of these acids joins with that alcohol, it produces a water molecule. So in the situation with triglycerides, because there's three fatty acids, you're gonna produce three water molecules when you make this complete triglyceride. This is the way we represent a triglyceride. It's a rounded head and it's got three branches off the bottom of it that represent those three fatty acids. Now I wanna to talk to you about phospholipids. They're very similar to triglycerides. Both the triglyceride and the phospholipid have the same glycerol backbone, but the phospholipid only has two fatty acid tails with the third space occupied by a phosphate group. And that phosphate group has a charge on it. These little phospholipids are represented by this little graphic right here. So it's the head that's got a charge on it with two fatty acids dangling off the bottom. All these phospholipids make up the bilipid layer of every cell membrane in our body. So any animal walking on Earth, it has all of these phosphates making up the cell membrane of every cell in their body. Now let's get into the specifics of omega-3 fatty acids. And there's three of them that we mentioned before, ALA, EPA, and DHA. And we're gonna start with the smallest molecule and go to the biggest molecule. The smallest of all these is called ALA or alpha linoleic acid. And its chemical formula is C18H30O2. This is the plant-based form of omega-3 fatty acids. And we get this from flaxseed, from chia, soybean, walnuts, so on and so forth. As you can see, there are 18 carbons in this molecule and it has three double bonds at the three and the six and the nine omega carbon. So it's an omega-3 fatty acid with additional double bonds at six and nine and gives it this characteristic hook shape as you can see right here. The other two, EPA and DHA, are derived from animal sources. And we get these from either mackerel or salmon, herring, shrimp, and oysters. The next bigger molecule, EPA, is C20H30O2, and the name EPA is actually descriptive of the molecule itself. It stands for icosa pentanoic acid. Icosa is Greek for 20, and that means it has 20 carbons in that molecule. Penta means five, and you can see there are five double bonds in icosa pentanoic acid. So that's how we get the name EPA. The next one is docosahexanoic acid, or DHA. That is C22H32O2. Docosa is Greek for 22, and hexa means six. So you can see this molecule has 22 carbons, and there are six double bonds. So docosahexanoic acid, and that's where they come from. Our body supposedly can convert a small amount of the smaller ALA to the two larger molecules, EPA and DHA, but it's minuscule. Maybe about 1% to 10% of ALA is converted into EPA, and 0.5 to 5% of ALA is converted into DHA. Otherwise, these are considered essential fatty acids. These are things that we have to take in in our diet. We cannot make them ourselves. So now I want to talk about some of the benefits of these uh, omega-3 fatty acids. First of all, they seem to provide us with an anticoagulation effect. Just like heparin and warfarin and aspirin, they thin our blood out and stop our blood from clotting. So if you have a predilection for heart attack and stroke, it may be helpful. 
They may help lower triglyceride levels. And most importantly, they seem to have an anti-inflammatory effect. And that is mediated through something called specialized pro-resolving mediators. And these SPMs, as they're also known of, are derived from the fish oils, EPA and DHA. These SPMs are known as lipoxins and resolvins and protectins and mericins, and they seem to help resolve the body's inflammatory response. Inflammation is a normal process that we use to fight infections and cancers. And what it does is when the body recognizes something that's not supposed to be there, it creates this hostile environment. And white blood cells come in there and they either physically you know, devour these bacteria and these oh. cancer cells, or they start producing what's called free radicals. And these free radicals attach to the invader or the cancer and they disrupt the DNA and they break down cell membranes and basically destroy that invasion so it doesn't become a problem for us. They create these pro-inflammatory cytokines. And usually we used to think that these things resolved on their own. But now we're seeing that in some patients, they don't resolve. And you end up with this chronic inflammatory state, which can be deleterious to the host body. And this is exacerbated by things like periodontal disease. So if you've got really bad gums that are constantly inflamed, or you've got a bunch of cavities in your mouth, diabetes and smoking, and all these things cause this chronic inflammatory response where the body is basically attacking itself and this is linked to a whole host of disease including stroke and heart attack and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and all these things that we used to be inevitable as we got older but that may not be the case if you eat right and you supplement appropriately you may be able to resolve some of these chronic inflammatory processes that may lead to these diseases of senility SPMs help resolve or limit the inflammatory response and therefore may help prevent some of these diseases associated with aging. So now let's talk about supplementation. Of course, the best way to get these omega-3 fatty acids is to eat the foods that they come from, the walnuts and the flaxseed and the fish that we talked about before, but maybe that's not your deal. You don't like to eat seafood, so on and so forth. You can supplement, but all supplements are not the same. Flaxseed contains the ALA, you can take some of that, but again, as we said before, the ALA may not afford you all the benefits of the fish and the krill oils that contain the DHA and the EPA. So I wanna talk specifically about the supplements of fish and krill oil because they're a little bit different. As we said before, the natural form of storage of all these oils is something called a triglyceride. Triglycerides are, to review, the glycerol backbone with three fatty acids dangling off the bottom of it. When you get these fish oils for processing, they take them out of the animal, they have to clean them up, and in the process of doing all that, they repackage them. They break up the triglyceride through a process of lipolysis, free those free fatty acids, take the glycerol off, and it's actually cheaper to combine it with another alcohol. Remember, glycerol is a three-carbon alcohol. Ethanol is also an alcohol, and you may recognize that because it's what we make our bourbon and gingers with. Ethanol is the alcohol that we consume. In industry, they can take these fish oils, and instead of combining them back with the triglycerides, they can combine them with ethanol. You just put grain alcohol in there, you heat them up, and you actually make these things called ethyl esters. And remember, an ester, esterification, is combining an alcohol and an acid. So an ethyl ester is the combination of ethanol with these fish oils. And this is the stuff that's usually marketed and put up on the shelves. Now, there are brands that actually provide the omega-3 fish oil fatty acids in their natural triglyceride form. And I can tell you, if it doesn't say natural triglyceride form on the bottle, it's probably an ethyl ester. And I'm not saying whether one's better than the other, but the triglyceride is the natural form of these fats. And I would highly recommend that you probably stick with the natural form if at all possible. I personally get mine from Costco. It's the Kirkland brand. You can see right on the front here that it says triglyceride. So that's the one I stick with. Now let's look at krill oil. Krill oil predominantly come in the form of a phospholipid, which have a charged phosphate head and two omega-3 fatty acids dangling off the bottom like we talked about before. And as we said, these phospholipids make up the bilipid layer of every cell in our body. So another natural form of a fat 
basically is what these phospholipids are. Because of this charged particle, some say that it's better absorbed by the body. I don't know if that's ever been proven or not, but you know, theoretically that is a possibility. But regardless, it is a natural form. So I usually take one omega-3 in the form of fish oil and one in the form of acryl oil. Also in the krill oil is something called astaxanthin, which is an antioxidant. It's a red pigment that is specific to krill oil. And krill are these little, you know, shrimp-like structures that flow through the ocean and they're eaten by baleen whales and all these other things. But it's supposed to be a natural antioxidant. And it gives it gives this krill oil its characteristic red oil. If you look at this, this is the actual oil from, from krill. You can see it's red. This is the oil from the uh, fish oil, the omega-3 fish oil, and you can see it's yellow like a standard fat. Some believe that this astaxanthin may protect the cell from damage. They also think because it's an antioxidant, it may improve the shelf life of this particular product if you're going to do it in a uh, supplement form. But again, that's not really been proven one way or the other. So wrapping things up, the best solution is to eat healthy with a varied diet, including natural sources of omega-3 fatty acids. If you're into that, if you need to supplement, do it reasonably, right? There is an anticoagulation effect associated with these omega-3 fatty acids. And I can tell you personally, taking too much of this stuff is problematic. You bruise like a grape. You bump your toe, everything swells up. It's painful. You can't do anything for days on end. So don't overdo this stuff. Remember, the poison is in the dose. Uh, water is a necessary chemical to maintain life, but if you take too much of it, it will kill you. So the same is, th is true with these omega-3 fatty acids. Too much of them is not going to be good. Personally recommend either the krill oil or natural triglyceride omega-3 fatty acids or a combination of the above. Personally, I take one of each. All right, guys, that wraps it up. Hopefully you got something from that. If you like what you saw, remember to subscribe below. If you like this content, you want some more of it, you can look at this video right here on this same YouTube channel, Cholesterol in Your Lipid Profile Labs Part 1. Did that about three years ago. I'm planning on doing Part 2 in a couple of months, so you can get a head start, look at Part 1, and then you'll be all ready for Part 2. As always, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.